It's the natural sciences, a field that started from Western philosophy, fueled by humans' innate desire to know more about the world that we are living in. From the smallest things that we ever know of, quartz and atoms, to the stars and planets in a faraway galaxy. With natural science, we are not only able to discover more about the rules of this universe, but also create our own worlds with lines of codes. Hi, I'm Talia. And I'm Joshua. And welcome to our podcast, The Uncommon Senses, where we discuss the nature of knowledge and how we know what we claim to know. Welcome to our special series of interviews, where we discuss different areas of knowledge with our guests. Today, we have Clement Lin, who is a university student from Nanyang Technological University, pursuing a major in aerospace engineering. So Clement, tell us a little bit more about your major and perhaps share a little bit on your university lives. So the major I took is in aerospace engineering, a bachelor, yeah, a bachelor's in aerospace engineering. And the reason I chose this major is because in high school, I was interested in physics and maths. Like those are the subjects that I felt like I had the most potential in. So I decided, so I decided to take up engineering also with the idea of having good job prospects in the future. And aerospace in particular is because, um, Personally, I'm interested in aviation, so I thought it would be cool to take a major that was they aligned with my interest and also with what I was good at in high school. Mm. And I would say my major is moderately difficult, but then it's def- it's manageable if like with enough like interest and passion. Yeah. Mm. So yeah, it sounds like a good university. Like, um, is there anything that stands out with like this major or this program? What is your experience as a first year student? Are you like overwhelmed or do you think like, oh, um, you know, it's actually pretty fun. It allows you to like interact with like perhaps maybe not hands on experience given that it's a pandemic, but do they have like, mm. you know, I-, I suppose to your education in Hong Kong, how do you think like the two uh, differentiates? I think the education in NTU is um, definitely has, compared to high school, has more of a focus on like teamwork and like collaboration oh, wow. like for like for example in, in even in my first year i already had like like lab work to do where we have to separate into mm. groups to complete like a lab work and even mm. in like other in some of my other courses they designed the classroom like like almost mm. as if it's designed for teamwork where like where each table actually had like a TV screen that you can use like to present. So I think that was pretty cool. Again, thank you so much for coming to our interview today. So, you know, knowing that engineering is a branch of natural sciences with a focus on design, construction, and the use of machineries, we would love to hear your thoughts on natural sciences and, you know, the nature of truth and knowledge within this academic discipline. So, you know, in our recent podcast episodes, we've been touching on the field of language and its validity. So tell us, is language necessary for the construction of knowledge in the natural sciences? Um, I would say, yeah, language is necessary for the construction of knowledge in, at least in natural science, since it allows us to articulate our thoughts and ideas and also communicate like our, our ideas and, con- and concepts in natural science with, most importantly, with precision and clarity. Mm-hmm. Which is, a very, which is one of the most important things in natural science. However, in addition to language, I also think that diagrams and visual cues are needed to facilitate language and scientific communication, since sometimes it may be more efficient or concise to use, like, for example, a table to organize the, in physics, let's say, the fundamental mm-hmm. particles and interactions in the standard model or let's say a diagram to show the process and components of uh, how a nuclear reactor works. Since these areas also require like a very high level of visualization to understand, pictures, therefore pictures and visual aids would be, is a nest, it's an integral part of uh, scientific, like this kind of scientific communication. And of course, language would still be needed for labeling, but in this case, it's better to use it alongside with methods of communication to maximize understanding. Uh, yeah, that's very true. I mean, for communication, it's definitely multifaceted. And we need all types of different methods to, in different types of situations, to really maximize the efficiency in trying to communicate different ideas. So, you know, you having studying a engineering degree, do you think you use more 
uh, language in the sense that word of words and perhaps like essays, or do you think you use more physical cues as you've mentioned earlier, like charts or like um, physical representation of knowledge? Mm, I, I would say, I would say in general more diagrams and stuff mm. because, for example, in like lab work, sometimes there are like word questions where we have to like dis then we have yeah. to use like words to just articulate yes. what we want like. Like for example, like what do we think of the results? Mm -hmm. Like these kind of ideas are more a bit more subjective than you would need to use language. Mm -hmm. But then for most of the other like of the other parts of the course, I would use more diagrams and charts and also like mathematical equations. Uh, and I also understand that you know in an engineering degree you need to use a lot of different equations and perhaps mathematical formulas. Do you consider those as a type of language? I would consider it as a type of language because you're ultimately conveying like meaning using like symbols and equations, but it's a bit different than language in the usual sense as in like English or Chinese because we're not really communicating like our emotions, uh -huh. but then, but then it's, I would say it's still like counts as a language because we're communicating knowledge. Mm -hmm like with meaning, yeah, through symbols and equations. Uh, so like, like in, in your definition, language does not have to be confined to the definition of, you know, words and perhaps only sentences. It can also, you know, it goes with anything as long as they can communicate meanings and messages um, efficiently. So, you know, in terms of your final thoughts, do you think language is useful to natural sciences as a whole? I would say yes. Since Despite as many flaws, it is still the most direct and effective way of communication we humans know. And as in science, we're always looking for clarity and precision. We cannot afford to use less effective ways to communicate. The key to overcoming the weaknesses in language is through education of the public, regulations in the scientific community, and also constant research and evolution in the field. By education, I mean we can incorporate scientific language into secondary and tertiary education to increase understanding of the scientific language language we use. And by regulations, peer review processes should be made more rigorous in checking if, uh, let's say, like, if language is used accurately and precise. And of course, like in many ways of knowing, language should always be improved on to make sure it adheres to the newest understanding we have on natural science. Uh, thank you. So moving on, I know the pandemic in the past has made it difficult for people in engineering majors to participate in hands-on experiments, but I'm sure you're going to have more lab or workshop opportunities in the coming year as the pandemic subsides. And as you know, when we talk about scientific experiments, human errors are reducible but unavoidable, making the data they produce uncertain. So given that all scientific experiments may be flawed, how can we know that, you know, what is truth in the sciences? How can we know that the data we collect is true or accurate? Well, I don't really think the aim of science is to reach like absolute uncertainty about something. Because such of an idea, like such such of an ideal is I would argue is kind of impossible. Through the scientific method, we conduct experiments and observe the results and repeat the process to reach a conclusion with an acceptable level of an uncertainty, keeping in mind that in the future, we might find like maybe a different theory to explain such phenomena that can explain the uncertainties that we have and maybe even the, like the outliers that we have in the past. Mm. So I see that in your answer, you've said that, you know, as long as you reach a conclusion with an acceptable level of uncertainty, that would be all right. So personally speaking, to you, what is an acceptable level of uncertainty? Well, in the scientific community, there have been different standards put out to make sure that exists, the extent of uncertainty stays within an acceptable level. I remember, like, for example, like, mm. there are analytical tools to show that the data is reliable and not a product of errors, such as the use of error bars and p-tests or an uncer uncertainty calculations. There are also safeguards we can use in experiments, such as repeated trials and vigorous protocols to make sure the experiments are performed fairly. So I think that even if, so, so that if, as long as these measures are followed, accurate and reliable results can still be produced, albeit with a certain extent of uncertainties.
And this has been proven effective throughout history, with more research and findings published every day that found their use in engineering, architecture, and programming. Yeah, that's very true. And I mean, this kind of like bringing back memories from our IB days when we're doing our IA and we have to scramble to make different charts and quantitative analysis to hand into our teachers, hoping that, you know, the results we have aligned with our expectations. However, as we all know, this may not always be the case, which has led to some cases per perhaps of academic fraud of, or students faking their data to prevent redoing the redoing their experiments, putting, you know, the scientific integrity into question. So what are your thoughts about, you know, falsified findings or like, you know, false data, falsehood in the scientific community? Addressing that, I remember reading an article that talked about the prevalence of p-hacking in scientific research, which where p-hacking is basically a process to make a result, no, no matter what result you get, more significant. Because there always there's always a bigger incentive to publish an article where you sh you identify a positive relationship than identify like no relationship due to maybe greater prestige or a higher salary which can cause um, more falsified findings in the scientific community i think there is always like some dig even even though of course it's not a good thing i think there's always some degree in us like of wanting to achieve the expected result. For example, when we did our physics IA in the IB curriculum, we wouldn't want to conclude our IA with like not being able to prove that the, the equation in the theory is correct. Which may give like us some maybe which may give some students the incentive to literally fake the data to make our results fit the the equation in the hypothesis. Since since we as students are in no position to disprove an equation that has been established for a few hundred years, for example. And that's why I think error bars and uncertainty calculation are important, albeit very repetitive and annoying, since it gives us room to still say that the equation derived from theory still matches our experimental data, whilst accounting for sources of error in our experiment that might be uncon uncontrollable. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, so far, you know, when we're talking about you know, error bars and uncertainty, we're talking about uncertainty as an unavoidable foe in the sciences where, you know, um, it, we, it's very hard to avoid them. We do try to put in different measures to uh, try to minimize this impact as much as possible. However, I understand that sometimes it could actually be a, a useful tool to our understanding of the natural world. So now I have like nearly zero knowledge in physics whatsoever but in, okay. yeah, in university chemistry i came across this concept known as heisenberg's uncertainty which states that due to the wave particle duality of matter such as light there is always going to be an uncertainty in position and velocity of an object so in this case given that error bars and uncertainty calculations could not aid us in eliminating uncertainty how should we approach this sort of findings that, seem, that seemingly incorporate, you know, the very principle of uncertainty in its principle, in its, like, at its core. I think this is definitely an interesting example, since this kind of uncertainty is not due to, like, a deficiency in our experimental setup where we can't measure a precise enough mm -hmm. magnitude of something, but rather it is an intrinsic principle in the theory of quantum mechanics. And sometimes I think we just have to accept the fact that sometimes the truth is uncertain. Many, for example, like many physicists initially felt unconvinced of quantum mechanics when it was initially proposed in the early 20th century due to the fact that it, the fact that the theory is based on a probabilistic nature rather than the deterministic nature of classical mechanics that pres that was established for a few hundred years before uh, the before quantum mechanics, meaning that where in classical mechanics, it means that we can pr predict precisely the magnitude of a quantity in the f in, in, the magnitude of a quantity in the future using the f using equations in the theory. And I think we just need to accept the fact that new theories can be um, unintuitive. But we just have to accept that if it is a more accurate like description of what we see at like of the nature that we see, then we have to accept it.
Yeah, I actually want to make the comment that Clement just mentioned about like in the future there's going to be potentially new theories like how you know quantum mechanics was not previously accepted. I think it is very interesting and it kind of almost echoes back to you know something that John mentioned about intuition um, and logic and reasoning and mathematics. Like yeah, for sure, maybe intuitively at the beginning stage of um, quantum mechanics or quantum theories people were really skeptical skeptical towards it because intuitively it's just a brand new field that no one has any experiences on however after doing like you know proving it with like logic and theory and finding more um evidence that you know basically proves this particular theory that it holds then yeah, I think there's going to be like definitely new theories coming up and paradigm shifts, even though intuitively it's something that we will disagree on or we think like it's impossible. Yeah, that's a very good point, actually. Yeah, I think, you know, because given that ch- change of, uh, changing changeability is a core feature of sciences, therefore uncertainty should not be viewed as a bad thing or like, you know, as bad as inconsistency or unreliability. So if in, in our world that we live in is inherently filled with paradox and the unknown, why should a field like natural sciences, which is supposed to represent our natural environment, show that? So given that uncertainty is both uh, avoidable and an integral part of natural sciences, how do we know that scientific conclusions are justified? Any thoughts on that, Clement? I think we always need to be critical of our own research findings in order to justify like, and justify any new claims that we put out. Like, for example, like that's why we have to try our best to refute our own findings, and it's only until we fail to do so that we can reasonably conclude our results are justified. For example, I remember the there was a story on the black swan, where where at a time when no one has discovered the black swan yet, people only thought that white swans existed, and every new knowledge and every new evidence of like visual evidence of white swans. Um, it made people think that black swans didn't exist. But it was only until, like, one person managed to identify black swan that did our perception change on what, like, for example, what colors can swans be? So I think, mm-hmm. so I think that's why it's very important for us to constantly reevaluate our own findings to challenge ourselves with new evidence, perhaps. Yes. Yes. Ah. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. Completely. And I guess you know that's. You know, part of the beauty of science in a sense that it is constantly changing to accommodate understanding of new knowledge where everything could be avoided as long as there is sufficient proof to it. Yet this is also this has also led to science to constantly change as old findings are often proven to be false or unrepresentative of the whole picture, as proven by newer and better evidence due to better technology or an accumulation of knowledge. So to what extent does knowledge in science change? And in your opinion, is that a good or bad thing? Mm, as discussed previously, knowledge, um, knowledge in science changes over time when new theories are developed and adapted over and preferred over old ones in light of new experimental evidence that show a discrepancy in the theory that was used at the time. And in particular, um, as Talia mentioned pre- previously, um, like paradigm shifts are when there is a profound change in a fundamental model, which, which may be sometimes very unintuitive. And for example, change from classical mechanics to quantum mechanics, or another, and another example being like a transition from Newtonian gravity to Einstein's theory of general relativity, which changed the way how we view gravity, which is not apparently not a force, but rather the curvature of space-time due to massive objects. And another example of that, of a change in our perception in natural science is the change from geocentric theory, which is the view that the Earth is the center of the universe and all of the objects go around it during the medieval and ancient Greek times, versus the now accepted hel- heliocentric model, which is that Earths and planets revolve around the sun, as proposed proposed by Nicholas Copern- Copernicus, mm-hmm. who is an, a Renaissance astronomer. Uh, yes, 
That's very true. And, you know, the, the power of natural science is slight in the way how it can sway how we view and experience the natural environment around us, such as, as you've mentioned, our understanding of gravity changes, you know, how we view our world and even open new possibilities in regards to how um, we see other, you know, planets and how other uh, how it changes our beliefs of how other spaces could exist where there could be stronger gravity or weaker gravity and as you've mentioned from the newtonian physics to the maxwell era to indeed our quantum physics era now natural sciences have been transforming our world since it's dawn and up till very recently there is a hypothesis that you know i'm sure Talia has mentioned <laughs> before that proposes that we are at the very tip of discovering a new era known as this simulation hypothesis so you know Clement we're both in the film and literature club back in secondary school and, yeah remember back in our good old days we saw this movie called The Matrix um, where it proposes a scenario where the entire world is living in a virtual reality a mere computer simulation and with technologies like VR and you know different types of virtual reality technologies getting better now better every day this kind of reality is getting more and more possible so basically this is what they're proposing that there is a possibility however slim it might be that we're now entering an era where it is very possible we're living in a simulation so you know personally speaking do you think we're <laughs> living in that kind of situation do you think everything is fake everything is like I feel like... Donald Trump would say everything is fake news do you think everything is really just a you know a bunch of codes and programs Honestly, I feel like we asked this question to all the ones that we are interviewing. Yes, but it's such, a yeah, <laughs> it's such a relevant question, right? I mean, you know, it, it concerns all of us. Like, what if we're all we're always looking for truth, and what if we're living in the computer simulation? That's a very yeah. scary reality in some sense, or a happy. Yeah, one, just maybe disclaimer. Like, this is not a cult that we're trying to form. <laughs> yeah, it's Scientology. Yeah. Where... <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, Clement, yeah. your turn. Yeah, so do you think we're living in a computer simulation? Well, wait, give me I a don't give a damn. Yeah, it's okay. It's, 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 it's a very profound question. Yeah. It, it deserves some time to think about. Personally, for me, I don't really think that we're living in a simulation because um, I, I see, I just see no like, I see no evidence supporting that. You know, given that, you know, there wouldn't be really any evidence to be there in the first place. But to me, I think, you know, hypothetically in this situation, you know, all our senses are deceived, right? So we're essentially blind or cut off from like the, I guess, the actual reality around us. So, you know, I guess it also shows this kind of flaw in sciences where, um, you know, some results could... Uh, because we rely on our senses so much in science, we look at all those you know, empirical methods to get to gauge an understanding of in uh, of our natural world. I think because our senses are so fallible, so it actually makes us vulnerable to different deceptions and perhaps uh, in this scenario, a computer simulation that kind of makes a fake world or a fake reality. Yeah, I don't know. What do you think about that, Talia? Do you think? You know, do you believe in such a situation? Do you think that's possible? Honestly, I feel like um, the chances of me kind of proving that the, 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 yeah. the theory is possible is is much more slim than me than the world is actually a simulation. So as of right now, I think <laughs> it's just a very fun theory, and I just don't care. Uh, someone yeah. is just going to tell me, announce me, you're living in a simulation. Hooray! Great! Like, <laughs> I think that's going to be my reaction to things. So yeah, yeah. Clement, but... your turn now. <laughs> wow. Okay, so as a STEM student, I oh. heavily believe <laughs> in, the sci in the scientific process. Mm -hmm. So... Mm. Yeah. Since we haven't found like any like evidence to refute that idea, I don't think we should roll that mm. possibility out, no matter how slim it is. Yeah. So I I would be open to, uh, open to the possibility to, that we are living in a simulation, even though I'm not entirely sure at this point. Yeah, I mean that's yeah. that's very true, and you know. On the topic of this, you know, matrix kind of question, if let's say we're presented with, you know, 
as in the movie, this red pill and blue pill scenario, where you know, with a blue pill, you're able to you know go into a actually I forgot which one is which, but like with one pill, you um you're uh, able to red, I think red, yeah yeah, yeah the, see the truth yeah to to wake red, up from yeah. this uh, yeah. st- a simulation, and for the other pill, you're essentially able to um you know to continue to live in this fantasy world. So, which pill would you guys choose? I'm just interested in knowing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I would choose the red pill because I like to think that I I like to have the idea that I to live life with purpose. And if you live, if, I feel like if I choose the blue pill, I would my life wouldn't have as much meaning or purpose compared to if I choose the red pill where I get to know the truth. So that yeah, that's why I think I would choose the red. Pill. Um, so tell ya, how about you? <laughs> yeah, honestly, I was like. Um, before Clement answered, I was like, "Ah,、oh, maybe I'll just take the blue pill, like whatever,、uh. right?" I'm just <laughs> because <laughs> because the only thing that I'm certain of by like idealism that we discussed previously is like our own minds. So then I right now I'm certain that this mind, real or simulated, is real for me at least. So I don't mind living in a in in the world where I'm kind of deceived because. Like if I never know, then I will never know, basically.、Uh, But after hearing Clement's answer, I also feel like, <laughs> yeah, like having a purpose to kind of realize the truth or like, kind of, you know, I think like why humans we're kind of always exploring all of these things is that we want to know the truth and we are curious about like the world that we're living in. So. Yeah, I I think having a red pill is also great. Like even though maybe it's like a huge risk, then I think we're willing to risk it because we are gonna die at some point anyway. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it's definitely a very you know STEM mindset. I think to really kind of you know just dis- to disregard your personal life for a minute and really try to search for the truth. In this、um, world that we live in now, and you know, after all, the key idea of natural sciences is to look for truth in our natural world. So, yeah, I think a lot of people would choose, like,、uh, you know, to taking like engineering degrees or perhaps like a natural science degree. They would choose like the red pill to look at,、mm-hmm. you know, to to really discover the truth behind everything we know of. And wouldn't that be neat, right? Because now. We have to use all these different big experiments to understand what is going on in the natural world. Would it just be awesome if we just take one pill and suddenly, like everything we know of, would make will be clear to us? We'll suddenly gain total like understanding of the world we live in. So yeah, I think that's a very、uh, interesting idea to explore, and you know, I. I, I Yeah, I think、uh, Telly brought a very good point as well about you know taking the blue pill. So it actually reminds me of the movie.、Um, I think it's called the Truman Show, where it's you know this person's life is essentially a show to like to show other people, and everything in his life is premeditated and prepared specifically for a plot line. And you know some people argue that taking the blue pill is good in this sense that you know your life would be essentially perfect. There's no so-called、mm. you know accident or you know horrible thing that goes、mm. go up. That's going on because essentially everything is coded and prepared for you, and you know I guess that's a、uh, that's also a、uh, very interesting point of view. Perhaps not for people who are actually so eager to search out the truth, but for people who would like to live a more stable or perhaps a more like、um, who just want to live those, a normal life. Yeah, those in business school where they just want to. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> Tell ya. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a business school that just wants to, you know, finance the system and like、oh. basically, you know, have money and live life well. I、yeah. I don't know why I'm talking about this because I partly、yeah. business school students.、So. I I mean maybe that's like because you know the duality of of Talia, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, on one hand, tell you you're you're like a very a STEM person, so you want to find out the truth. On the other hand, you also express some kind of desire to like, perhaps to make you know to to find a way to survive and to thrive in this world that we're in、yeah. now, no matter if it's true or false. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why I'm psychoanalyzing you, but <laughs> I think yeah, that's a very interesting point. I mean. As humans, I think we all have the different types of desires within us,、mm-hmm. and sometimes those desires could be contradictory or like paradoxical. So yeah, yeah. So um, 
back to our interview question. So, as we've seen so far, science is evolving in a way that humans could hardly keep up or even anticipate, thanks to innovation and unprecedented waves of new ideas and creativity. But despite how far science has evolved, many of our ideas are still grounded in foundational or fundamental theories laid out by our predecessors and ancestors. So, in, in your opinion, Clement, would you say that previous knowledge is more important than creativity in science, or vice versa? And by previous knowledge, it, it doesn't have to be like um, pro uh, proposed um, concepts or theories. It could even be like previous methodologies that have proven to be effective, such as you know a step-by-step -step guide for science experiments, as we've often seen in perhaps like secondary school experiments. Mm. Even though this might seem like a very cliche answer, yeah. I think both definitely both are important. Mm -hmm. Like for example, in previous not and about previous knowledge, it is, is important for us to learn how like the scientific theory has been developed like over time, which builds a like good foundation or a stepping stone for further like scientific research or creating new theories in the future. But at the same time, creativity is like it's really important because it helps us to construct new theories that may seem very counterintuitive, especially when seen from this perspective of like the previous well-established theories. And I think a good example to illustrate that is when Einstein uh, hypothesized that light was actually comprised of discrete packets of, of energy rather than uh, mag magnetic radiation, which ultimately won him the Nobel Prize mm. and changed our understanding of light completely. So I think, both are important, but then maybe if I had to choose one, it would be creativity. In order, mm -hmm. in order for if we're talking about like advancing scientific uh, knowledge in the future. Ah, uh, okay. Can, can you explain more about like why why creativity over like prior experience? Do you think like you know um what 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 aspect of creativity makes it you know far more better than you know having prior experience? If we have to choose one in this scenario, because I think mm -hmm. if you're if you focus too much on like the previous theories, it can limit like mm -hmm. limit your horizon, limit mm -hmm. your scopes, which which would halt like scientific development. But then mm -hmm. I think keeping an open mind is definitely more useful for the future. Although we shouldn't, of course, we shouldn't disregard previous like scientific discoveries. But then yeah, that's why I think creativity is just a bit more important. Yeah, that's that's a very valid point, and I mean, you know, creative creativity and innovation is the life force of scientific advancement. Mm -hmm. We're able to advance so much, you know, nowadays is because of people thinking of more creative solutions to prior problems. So, Talia, um, before I've heard that you you like to compare a scientific experiment to cooking, right? So, you know, using that metaphor, do you think creativity or experience is more important in that sense? Oh. Actually, um, yeah, like I like the fact that you brought this up. Um, I will definitely say that both creativity and experience are important. Um, like I think when I was referring to the cooking analogy, I was thinking about how you know I don't really like these labs, especially <laughs> chemistry labs, yeah, where you have to be so precise with everything. But then for me, my cooking is just like intuitive, like whatever it tastes good it's great mm. if it's too bland add salt if it's too salty add water like basically that's just my, my um philosophy with cooking and i think it's just like basically it's a really fun process it's kind of like doing experiments because mm. you are adding things together um but then you have like a lot of creativity from this because you're able to there isn't no pre precise measurements for for me and my cooking um, and in terms of experience, I think it's also necessary because like if what I cooked, it's bad, like I don't have any experience with like cooking, like, yeah, basically it's bound to get burnt or be bad if you have never had too much experience with like having fun with food ingredients. And actually this brought me to a really fun point with like Chinese cooking and Western cooking and potentially, you know, beyond just the cooking realm, but like a lot of culture aspects as well. For I think for Chinese cooking, um, when you search for recipes, they always have this term, shi liang, so a suitable mm. amount. Like how many salt, shi liang, so a suitable amount. 
how many oil should have like a suitable amount. But then in Western cooking, you'll be seeing like flour, how many grams, um, how many teaspoons, how many tablespoons of oil, and stuff like that. So it's very precise, even in Western cooking. I think that's where like because we are definitely learning majority of our learning are from like Western science perspective, and we really do focus on like uncertainty, like precision, accuracy, all of things. I think it's just a pretty much a fundamentally Western idea. Um, meanwhile, with the Chinese one, is more like go with the flow, like with your expression, and that's yeah, basically also seen through um, cooking as well. And I think Joshua, you also understand you. We also went to learn how to sew qi pao. Yes, yes. And yeah, it's very different from Western fashion. But I do understand why Western fashion is like, or Western methods is like, kind of like being the mainstream in the world because it, we're in the world after like industrialization. And industrialization proves that we can like produce a lot of things in a very short amount of time with high efficiency. And I can see like how these precise measurements allow you to have produce things really fast and um, be able to have the kind of results that, you know, is consistent and hence you can build other theories on top of those results because it's very consistent. And yeah, it's similar to like fashion. You're able to have precise measurements and then just produce it mass production. Um, but I think it, it doesn't mean that, you know, other methods like the Chinese method where you use more with your intuition <laughs> is uh, not as important. I remember previously I actually had an interview with like um like I think he, like she's a f physician um and like he's she's a professor who's in the medical field and she has uh basically she studied western medicine and she like like said that um <clears throat> something a difference that she observed with like a Chinese method and a Western method is like, let's say if there's a needle that fell on the floor and no one can find it, then what is the Western way and what's the Chinese way to find it? So for, for the Western way, people are possibly going to use very, um, you know, a, they're definitely going to come up with a method such as like dividing the floor to different blocks, like nine yeah. squares, and then find the That's needle in one square is there a needle? If no, cross it out. Look at the other square. If there's a needle, cross it out. But maybe for the Chinese one, it will be uh, more like free. Like basically, we're just going to search for it together. And But then that doesn't necessarily mean that the Western method, people are going to find the needle faster. So I think that's just like an interesting difference with, um, you know, Western and Chinese methodologies in general through this idea of cooking. And but then I I think that there is definitely a reason of why like the, this Western method is something that we're used uh, that is being used for uh, like most of the cases. But then I think that doesn't uh, prove anything about like the Chinese method or other alternative methods are you know not as good. Yeah. So yeah, that's just my views on cooking and also some things ideas that stem from that. Yeah, I completely really agree with like your point, and it actually like it reminds me of like my internship experience. So uh, I actually went into a lab in my university to act as an intern to help them to perform some experiments regarding to um, cancer medicine, and you know when I, I did this part where. Um, I did chemical synthesis, so essentially I'm trying to uh, follow different protocols to uh, to cr to create these different kind of synthetic drugs to go up uh, to kind of uh, bind to cancer cells. And throughout this process, mm -hmm. I realized that you know from you know my mentors telling me or from my professors teaching is that I don't really have to follow exactly what is written on the protocol, mm -hmm. and that you know sometimes they'll give me little hints to how I could adjust my experiment sets. That deviates up with the standard protocol to perhaps better my um, experiment. So, you know, definitely I would say that, you know, um, mm. being able to fle flexibly change, um, ch being able to flexibly change pre written or prior knowledge is very fundamental mm. to really optimize the scientific results you're really looking for and you know what you're saying also really reminds me of how um you know as you've mentioned in chinese medicine a lot of the things we do is not really based on a really fixed um 
way or fixed concepts or fixed theories that has been proven from time to time we're kind of really just using our experience and yeah. you know intuition in chinese medicine and kind of locating diseases and you know just treating our body as like an ecosystem rather than mm. a machinery where you know we have to be really precise and to really look at a single spot to cure an illness but rather we look we're looking for different ways or really flexible methods to better our body to prevent or to um work against different illnesses and ailments and you know i think that's a very you know interesting point you've made and of course that also ties in with you know clement's point about you know how creativity really stands out in the, the natural sciences in terms of how it's able to really push a, a scientific advancement to uh, put, push it further to a you know to go over our um understanding now and to really create new solutions to problems that we're facing now so you know thank you so much for input today clement and i think yeah, you brought some you. Re really interesting points and have truly taught us more about what it means to find truth in the natural sciences and mm -hmm. next i think we have talia to guide us through some very intriguing discussions about taking stem as a university major so yeah talia take us away